dare I say that John Ottman's X-Men theme is on the same level as the X-Men 90s theme. It, it might be there, I kind of love it. So in anticipation for Deadpool and Wolverine, today's movie commentary is going to be on, in my opinion, the best X-Men film, X-Men Days of Future Past. And I just need to reiterate, in anticipation for Deadpool and Wolverine, because in my previous Deadpool and Wolverine trailer reaction, I said that I didn't like the trailer, but I'm excited for the movie. But the comment section apparently took that as a means of me going, oh, the film's going to be crap. I never said that. Like, in no way, shape, or form in that video do I say that the film's gonna be rubbish. I just said I didn't like the trailer that much. And then literally the other week, Marvel Studios released the final trailer for Deadpool and Wolverine. And in my opinion, it's just a much better trailer. It's got more heart, it's got more emotion. Granted, they may have spoiled it by revealing X-23, but overall, the trailer was just much better edited. I got a sense of the stakes, of the heart, of the emotion of the film. That's all I wanted from that previous Deadpool and Wolverine trailer. Like, literally, if you watch my trailer reaction video, I don't say I hate the film. I didn't say that, I just said I don't think the trailer is well edited. Anyways, I digress, back onto the topic. X-Men Days of Future Past, in my opinion, is the best X-Men film. I love it so much, it's so great. You got the collision of the two generations of X-Men, the X-Men first class cast meeting the original X-Men cast, the time travel, the visual effects, the score, this film is really great. And then when we get into the film, you get the overall sense and vibe of the film, it just feels like Terminator. It's just a cool time travel story. Like, I don't think it's a one-to-one -one adaptation of the comics, I haven't read Days of Future Past in like a good long while, and I also have not watched the episode of the animated series. The thing is, I'm not really an X-Men guy. Growing up, when it came to Marvel Comics, Spider-Man, Daredevil. Wolverine and Deadpool as well, but other than that, that was it. I wasn't really like an X-Men guy. I didn't grow up in the 90s cartoon, I haven't watched X-Men 97. Most of my knowledge of the X-Men comes from the movies. Like, I haven't really read many X-Men comics. I mean, you know, they'll pop up in like a Spider-Man run here and there or something, but I haven't really, you know focused on the x-men much when i was reading comics and granted this is like a really normy answer but realistically i'm kind of a wolverine and a deadpool guy that's kind of it don't get me wrong i really like professor x and i really like magneto but yeah for the most part i'm a deadpool and a wolverine guy anyways enough preamble let's just get into the commentary but before we get into the commentary don't forget to like comment subscribe film the social media all the good stuff it's all down in the description and don't forget to follow me specifically on instagram that's where i'm most active okay cool now that's out of the way let's get into x-men days of future past also, I don't know if you know this, but when the 20th Century Fox logo fades to black, the X lingers on screen for like a fraction of a second longer. It's so cool, I love that detail. It only happens in Brian Singer's X-Men films, starting from X2, I think. Like, it's in X2, and then it's in Days of Future Past and Apocalypse. Okay, what I will say, actually, was growing up, I did watch Wolverine and the X-Men, and I remember the intro for that cartoon, always having, like, the desolate future-looking city, and the Sentinels, like, patrolling the streets. This opening really reminds me of that. Also, you can tell that Brian Singer directed this film. When you watch X2 and the first X-Men, it feels like this film, but obviously this film is just more modern. I say that the film is literally 10 years old, which is just insane to me. Because this film came out in the same year as The Amazing Spider-Man 2 and Winter Soldier and Guardians of the Galaxy. Like, that's just... That's so bizarre to me. Like, that's just... Huh? Is the future truly set? <laughs> God, John Ottman's a legend. That theme is awesome. Like, again, it is, I think, just as iconic as the 90s X-Men theme. This theme is awesome. Like, in terms of, like, the main themes for a comic book film, this is up there. This this is really one of the most, like, high-producing themes. It's awesome. Sentinels. The thing I will say about Days of Future Past is that when you compare it to the previous X-Men films by Brian Singer, it's the most comic booky one, but it also feels a bit like it is kind of ashamed of its source material. Like, you have the really cool powers of, like, Blink and stuff, and whilst you do have comic accurate looking characters like Bishop, for the most part, it again kind of falls into that aesthetic of, oh, we're kind of ashamed to, like, embrace the comic book material, so the costumes are going to look more, like, tactical, but also they're not really going to be bright colours, it's just going to be kind of, like, black material. It's not really black leather in this, it's, like, black armour. Also, not to mention the Sentinel designs in this film, just... They don't look very good, especially when you compare it to like the Sentinel and X-Men The Last Stand. Like that at least looks like the Sentinel. What they look like in this film, just... No, that's not a Sentinel. Though I will say, design-wise, they do look cool when like, you know, their armor kind of like 
um, what's the word? It kind of like, well, it reacts like Mystique. Their armor moves around like Mystique when she shapeshifts, which is cool because that's how they originate in this film. I just wish they also looked like the Sentinels from the comics, or at least the ones in like the 70s. I wish the ones in the 70s flashback looked more like the comic book ones. This opening's really cool. We see the massacre of this mutant team. We see Kitty Pryde like rushing forward and then exploring her time travel powers, which is a thing the film makes up because who is it again in the comics that does it? Or is it Kitty that can do it? But you feel the tension, you feel the stakes. So I'm using teams are on the run from the Sentinels and the Sentinels just come in and massacre them all. It really sets up the stakes. It's cool. Too late, assholes. Okay, that's such a like movie moment. Like how did she know at that exact moment Bishop had done enough to warn them? Or was it the fact that they were gonna die and the rules of this film is that once you establish something in the past, then you change the future regardless, so... Was that the case? I don't know, it just feels very much like a movie moment. Way there he is, there's my boy, there's Hugh Jackman looking peak Wolverine I'd say. I'd say in my opinion this is Wolverine's best design. Like the hair, the cigar in the mouth, just something about the way Hugh Jackman looks in this film. This is like peak Wolverine. I mean obviously he's not wearing the yellow costume, but when you compare him to the previous films, this in my opinion is my favourite Wolverine look. The Sentinel program was originally conceived by Dr. Bolivar Trask. Funny, because I thought in X-Men 3 Trask was a black guy. Maybe they're distantly related or something. Again, that's just the X-Men continuity. The Fox X-Men continuity is just so messy and it's like god damn how, how did you mess up the continuity so badly in this? but at the same time too i do understand from like a filmmaking standpoint the director just wants the cast who they want to direct they want peter dinklage so they got peter dinklage after the vietnam war she found trask and killed him this is a little bit exposition heavy but i'd say like one to two minutes of exposition is enough just so we can set up the stakes set up the story yes it's a little exposition heavy but at the end of the day it's necessary because once it happens you're in it. You're just straight into the time travel adventure. <sighs> yeah, that's my huge jacked man. Sorry, I had to. That's a really bad pun, but... Hugh Jackman as Wolverine is one of the best cast comic book characters ever. Not only does he look like him, granted, yes, he's too tall to be the comic accurate height. But regardless of that, he looks like him. He behaves like him. He's just... Oh, he's so good. I love him so much. The charisma, the screen presence, his physicality. He really commits to this role and you just love him for it. Like one of my favorite things in X2 is when Stryker's men are raiding the mansion. They enter the kitchen and Logan's with Iceman and then like, you know, they start shooting up the place and then Wolverine just goes shing, goes straight for the guy, stabs him in the chest and just like, ah. I love it when Hugh Jackman's Wolverine goes berserker mode. It's so good. He's one of the best castings ever. Like. It's funny, you can replace him as Wolverine, like, you can, but at the end of the day too, who do you get? Because he's just so good. At ease. This actor does a really good job mimicking Jennifer Lawrence's mannerisms, because obviously this is meant to be Mystique, and this is at a time too where Mystique isn't the cold, hard-blooded killer. She kind of doesn't really know what she's doing. She's off on her own, she's not with Magneto, so she's kind of just doing what she wants to do, but she's unsure of it. That unsurety, the actor nails, but also he manages to do it in a way that Jennifer Lawrence would do it. Like, I'm assuming they probably had Jennifer Lawrence act out the scene, and then he mimicked her. Kind of like what Emma Watson did with Helen and Bonham Carter in Deathly Hallows Part 2. Props to him, that's a really good performance. So that's meant to be Toad from X-Men 1, but they look nothing alike and what's Toad doing here in the 70s? He wasn't that old in X-Men 1, like, again, X-Men and their continuity. You and I are gonna be good friends. <laughs> you just don't know it yet. God, Hugh Jackman's Logan is so good. I, just, I love him so much, man. Uh, Nicholas Holt's Beast makeup doesn't look great. I don't think it looks very good. Especially when you compare it to Kelsey Grammer in X3, like, X3, that's Beast. In this film, doesn't look very good. 50 years from now, like in the future 50 years from now. Yeah. I sent you from the future. I also love James McAvoy as a younger Professor X. He's just so good. He's so charismatic. But not only that, he's also just a great actor. And just, I love his interpretation of Professor X. But I also love Patrick Stewart's interpretation of Professor X. In many ways, just, they're both really good. And I'm going to say to you what you said to us then. Fuck off. He actually said go fuck yourself, so uh... Mm. We'll say I don't understand the science behind this, so the formula that suppresses Beast's powers can be used to also suppress Professor X's mind control, but also at the same time, it gives him his ability to walk? I don't think that science is. Uh, JFK, 
he killed. <laughs> Man, comic books love doing the whole JFK was killed by X, Y, and Z comic book character. You have this film with Magneto, and then you have Jeffrey D. Morgan's comedian in Watchmen. You guys won. I didn't do anything. I've been here all day. So we are now at the point in the film where we get introduced to Quicksilver. And the thing that I'm going to say, I don't know if this is unpopular or not, but Evan Peters' Quicksilver is great, but he's also not comic book Quicksilver. Like, realistically, the better portrayal is Aaron Taylor Johnson in Age of Ultron, but Evan Peters is really charismatic and really likeable, so that's why I feel like he's the favourite on-screen version of Quicksilver. But if you go for comic book accuracy, Evan Peters' Quicksilver is just not as accurate as Aaron Taylor Johnson's. I feel like a lot of the greatness of the scene all does boil down to Evan Peters' as Quicksilver because he's just so entertaining. Whip. Lash. Whip. Lash. What'd you do, man? What'd you do? What'd you do? What you do, man? What you do? What you do? Like, he's just entertaining to watch. That's kind of it. That's why he is the more entertaining Quicksilver. Like, he might not be the most comic book accurate, but as a character, as a movie character, he's entertaining. I don't know karate, but I know crazy. I don't know karate. <laughs> I don't know why he takes that line so literally, but it's funny. Charles. Good to see you too, old friend. This film also does really build upon the dynamic of Magneto and Professor X from First Class. The way they interact and reluctantly team up, it feels organic and natural. Though a thing I will say about this film is that in many ways, it would have been nice if we had an X-Men First Class sequel before this one, which was the intended plan. When Matthew Vaughn made First Class, he planned on a trilogy of X-Men films where he wanted to do First Class, then another X-Men film, and then do Days of Future Past. The concept for Days of Future Past would have been the exact same, but he just wanted to explore the stuff that this film kind of skips over. If I could save time in a bottle. Also, this is probably why Evan Peters' Quicksilver is more popular than Aaron Taylor Johnson's one. That's because he just has the better super speed effects. Like, these super speed sequences are insanely good. This and the one in X-Men Apocalypse are so great, and all the films that try to rip off this scene don't do it well at all. <laughs> Black Adam. <laughs> like, when you think about it, this scene was actually kind of revolutionary, and it's pretty great. Although, if you really do think about it, the physics for that scene don't entirely make sense, but it's a comic book film. Why are you thinking about physics like that? Imagine if they were metal. Ah, it's funny, because in the previous X-Men films, Magneto would overpower Wolverine by using his adamantium skeleton against him. It's kind of a fun line. Where were you when your own people needed you? Hiding! You abandoned us all. Ah, oh, Fastbender is so good as Magneto. When Matthew Vaughn made First Class, he did a really good job of recasting Professor X Magneto. Like, McAvoy and Fastbender are just as good as Patrick Stewart and Ian McKellen. Though a decision of this film is to have Fastbender talk in an English accent, which I much prefer. Like, that was the weirdest part of First Class, was how you could hear the Irishness in Fastbender's Magneto. Like, I wasn't a fan of that. Want to pick all that shit up? Hugh Jackman's like deadpan delivery as Wolverine. It's so good. <laughs> McAvoy and Fastbender's relationship to Professor X Magneto is just so well done, and I feel like this film continues the stuff from first class in a very organic way. Where like they are best friends, but they're also rivals. They are the opposite sides of a coin. I love it. I love that they keep up the chess motif from the previous films as well. <laughs> Okay, so I haven't actually seen the Rogue cut of Days Future Past, but from what I know about that cut is that from this point in the film, there's like a subplot where they go and find Rogue, and then they get Rogue to replace Kitty Pride because she's just been injured by Wolverine. I haven't seen it, but I'd be curious to find it one day and watch it. Who are you? Charles. Well, Charles Xavier! Charles Xavier! I have no idea why Mac... <laughs> I have no idea why he delivered it like that, but I love it. What the hell is that? What the hell is that? Oh, he's so good. This this is such a good comedy bit. The thing I'll say about the X-Men films is that when you compare it to the MCU films, the way they integrate comedy, it just feels more organic. The reactions of the character are just genuine, which makes it funny. There's no stopping and pausing and winking at the camera and, hey, let's go tell a joke now. Why don't you have the beef? We've only got beef. Like, no. This is how you do comedy. Okay, so I haven't really talked much about her, but Jennifer Lawrence is a mystique in this. I like her in the first two, so First Class and Days Future Past, but from this point on, she kind of is just a bit... 
irrelevant as a character. It's like they really like force her to be front and center because it's Jennifer Lawrence, but you can tell that Jennifer Lawrence doesn't care. And her indifference on playing the character really shows in Apocalypse and Dark Phoenix. But that being said, I do like her in this film and I think performance wise she does do a good job. Though from what I can tell they really do focus on the Professor X Magneto Raven relationship, but like I don't think that's a thing from the comics. From I mean, again, I'm not really an X-Men guy, but let me know if that is. You'll pass me. No, I don't want your suffering. I don't want your future. This is the best scene of the film. This film, this scene is so good. McAvoy's performance, the way they recontextualize the original X-Men films, X-Men 1, 2, and 3, and they somehow make it feel cohesive. That was actually something this and the Wolverine do quite well, is that they fix the bad elements of X-Men The Last Stand and they make it work within their stories. Although granted, Logan's obsession with Jean doesn't really make much sense. Like they don't have that much chemistry and they don't have that much screen time. Like I know Wolverine is always in a love triangle with Jean Grey and Cyclops, but it's kind of like, I don't know. The way like the Wolverine kind of like pans that whole relationship thing, it's a bit much. Just because someone stumbles, loses their way, it doesn't mean they're lost forever. This scene is incredible. It's so good. Like, if only we as humans had the ability to talk to our past and future selves. <sighs> so good. This scene is incredible. And the score, too, for this scene, too. Like, we need you to hope again. Mwah. John Ottman. Mwah. McAvoy. Mwah. Patrick Stewart. Mwah. The thing that I don't understand about this film, too, is that whilst the concept feels very comic booky, and this feels like the most comic booky X Men film at the time, first class aside, I mean, in terms of like Brian Singer's like X Men vision, the Magneto costume is kind of lame in this. Like, it's like blacky maroon, but it doesn't look very aesthetic, and it's like, why not just embrace the more comic booky elements? Because the final design of the costume in this film just isn't that great. I promise me you'll find us, use your power, bring us together. Guide us. Lead us. I also love Logan's evolution in this film. The scene with him and Professor X on the plane where he's just like, promise me that when I go back, you know, and we fix everything, you find Scott, you find Gene, you find the X-Men, and you build them, you lead them. Like, yes, you can say that the Fox X-Men films were too reliant on Wolverine as the main lead, but like, Hugh Jackman's too good as the lead, but also it's like, why not? Wolverine's the coolest mutant. But even still, I like the character's evolution of him not wanting to be part of the X-Men in the first film, to him kind of going like, no, yeah, the X-Men are needed and you need to lead them. I like the gag of Wolverine finally being able to walk through a metal detector without it going off because he doesn't have the adamantium skeleton yet. Like, I think that's just really amusing. The third act of this film is... It's alright, it's decent. Like, I will say, there are stronger X-Men finales, mainly X2. This one's kind of like, yeah, Magneto, like, drops a baseball stadium outside the White House. And Mystique's all just like, yeah, I'm gonna go kill the president. But then Charles talks her down and she doesn't kill the president. Magneto just, like, flicks Wolverine away and it's just, like, a conversation between Raven and Professor X Magneto, which is good, but it's not the most, like, thrilling thing. This isn't, like, the big action spectacle set piece. But then again, you can argue, too, this is intercut with the stuff in the future where they're finally being caught and found by the center. But even still, this film is great. I love the overall emotions and the characters. Like, all the character work done between Raven and Professor X Magneto, it works. Especially when Fastbender delivers that amazing speech, like, Fight together in a brotherhood of our kind. A new tomorrow. Him as Magneto delivering those speeches, incredible. But the thing you can say about the X-Men film franchise is that from this point on, the films do feel a bit stale. They do kind of just repeat the same points and they do say the same things. Professor X Magneto's relationship kind of is just the same thing. Their ideologies are the same thing. They just keep repeating it. Not that it ruins this film, it's just that when you watch the X-Men films as a whole, you watch the whole series, they do kind of just repeat the same thing and you can tell why this franchise fizzled out. Though that being said, I actually don't think Dark Phoenix is that bad. It's not great, but I don't think it's that bad. This bit in the third act where Wolverine wakes up in the future and he sees Scott and Jean and Professor X, it's so good. You know, Kelsey Grammer's little cameo is Beast, just it's so good and I won't lie, Part of me is kind of annoyed that Hugh Jackman did Logan because we don't get to see these guys suit up and fight together. We don't get to see them be the X-Men. Like, I don't know, the fact that they're all kind of just brought back to die is kind of lame. It's not this film's fault. When you see it in context of this film, it works perfectly fine. You're just like, yay, it's Scott and Gene and Beast and stuff. It's the X-Men. Okay, this ending is the most confusing part of the film because why is Mystique disguised as the Striker and why does she take Wolverine? 
Huh? Like, it's just a bit confusing. Like, why would she take Wolverine? Like, why is this Mystique a striker? I don't think this was actually supposed to be the actual ending. I think Brian Singer changed this at the last minute and was just like, yeah, no, we're going to make Striker Mystique. But that doesn't make any sense. But regardless of that... <laughs> So that was X-Men Days Future Past, and I do love this film. Like, granted, I don't think the third act is the most, like, thrilling thing ever, but I still really like it, and overall as a film, I think it is the strongest X-Men film. The meeting of the two generations of X-Men cast, Hugh Jackman as Wolverine, Michael Fassbender, just, mwah, it's, it's all really great. As a film, as a time travel story, it's really epic, it's really thrilling. It's not the most comic accurate thing, but it's still, as a film, as a piece of entertainment, it's really exciting, it's really great. It's a really good, like, sci-fi film. If this film did not have X-Men in the title and this was just a sci-fi film, it's really good. You can't really blame the squandering of the X-Men films after this because, yeah, they really should have done better with Apocalypse and Dark Phoenix. Though, again, I don't think Dark Phoenix is that bad. But this film was kind of great as, like, a soft reboot of the X-Men franchise. It's really good. As a film, again, it's just really entertaining and really thrilling to watch. Hugh Jackman as Wolverine is so goddamn good in this. Brian Singer's direction and him bringing back the motifs from X2. Mwah! John Altman's score. Mwah! I really like this film. And yeah, overall, I do think it probably is the best X-Men film. But those are just my thoughts on X-Men Days Future Past. What do you guys think about it? Let me know in the comments down below. Like, comment, subscribe, follow me on social media, all the good stuff. Until we meet again, I'll see you guys next time.